discussion. I'm Joseph. I'm subbing in for some of the folks we have lined up. Uh, you'll continue this discussion with your lab leaders, um, both talking about um, policy apps on topic, critical apps on topic, and those sorts of things. Uh, but today, um, I just wanted to sort of give a brief overview to sort of give some context to um, how we want to approach uh, being affirmative in general, um, and then sort of uh, open that up for thinking about how that applies to uh, this year's topic. For today, I just wanted to give you all a brief overview about being AF uh, when it comes to sort of a traditional policy AF, right? To sort of take things back to basics as a starting point uh, for a discussion about uh, how do we use these sorts of like ground, ground and sort of foundational things uh, to sort of design your AF, uh, particularly for JV and Open that are starting to sort of create your own ideas and go into the world, right? Like, what is it that makes an AF an AF versus sort of like a speech or a performance or um, or like, like outside of competitive debate, right? Um, like what ties together uh, these policy apps and performance apps or critical apps, right? Like what is it at the center that makes it an AF that doesn't make it a K? Or what is it that makes it an AF that doesn't make it, um, that, that what is it that makes it debate? Okay. But in short, um, that the, point of the AF is that you've got to convince the judge uh, that passing the AF is a good idea, right? Um, that it meets the burden proof and that it's better than the status quo. That somehow, comparatively, something about what you are advocating needs to change uh, what's going on in the world, right? Um, and you've got to defend, defend those burdens, right? That failure to do so means you lose the AF, right? That on the negative, it's very easy, or well, it's not easy to be negative, but rather, uh, the negative just has to win one of those points, right? Um, to do this, you've got to prove three things. First, that the advantages of the plan are larger than the disadvantages, right? So impact calculus. Second, that the plan is inherent, right? That there is some sort of change that you create, right? That there's some sort of demand for the AF that the status quo cannot fulfill. Uh, and third, that all of these problems that you bring up, that you somehow address them, right? whether it be sort of passing a plan that solves those things or uh, in the world of um, other apps, like how do you impact the world around you? So in order to uh, convince the judge to pass the plan, you've got to prove the app is better than the SWO, right? That there is something better. In order to prepare for a debate, uh, the starting point is always your 1AC, right? Too often uh, what I see in uh, not just uh, debates at my leagues, but debates nationally and across the country, is that the 1AC goes underutilized, right? That it's uh, eight minutes that's there, but then gets dropped, right? So you want to start with how you design your AF, right? Is what's in the 1AC timed, right? Is it fluid? Does it make sense, right? Because it's, that's the first impression, not just for the judge, but for your opponents, right? When it comes to that sort of like uh, intimidation factor, a 1AC that's perfectly timed to that eight minutes, that's performed powerfully, that runs fluidly, right? And that you know the details of that app, that you can defend it in cross X is the most important starting point for any AF round, right? That being able to answer those particulars, right? I know you've all been in those rounds, right? Where have you ever had that round where someone asked that cross X question and you just don't know the answer and it seems super obvious, right? Uh, for our policy folks, it's like, what's the mechanism? Or like, who's funding for the plan? Right, for the K folks, right? Why vote AF, right? You've all seen those K rounds where it's like, why vote AF? And it's the first question, the cross X of the 1AC and folks get stuck there. Um, but so that's why it's important to sort of know the ins and outs of your 1AC, better than any of your blocks, better than any of the other stuff, right? Because it creates something for you to lean back on. As Gabriella is saying, that the AF has to solve or change something, right? That if it doesn't, that's why the, the that's what vote neg on presumption means, right? That um, presumption just means that the AF doesn't do anything to better the situation, that the SQUO is preferable. Awesome, All right? So in order to make sure your 1AC is prepared, some of these things may seem simple, but oftentimes you go into it and forget to do some of these things, especially if you're using a new AF, right? And this is gonna be especially important at the beginning of the season. You wanna make sure that you know the words, right? That you know the terminology in your AF. We, we all get handed cards sometimes and we sort of like go years for uh, mispronouncing it. Um, I know it took me a couple uh, days to figure out hegemony and some of those, right? Especially as you get into the K literature, those words just get bigger and bigger, so make sure you know how to say them. Um, you wanna highlight and underline the cards, right? Um, to find the, not just uh, the things that sound powerful, but to make sure that you're highlighting the warrants in the card, right? Because that's what's gonna be the most important part 
uh, for how you articulate the app later. And then finally, uh, you want to pre-note the 1AC. Um, so that means sort of being able to earmark when to reference what card, right? So if someone asks the question about solvency, you should be able to know off the top of your head, this card, uh, like the author's name, right? So I don't know, let's say Sanchez in 2020. It just helps you sound like you know what you're doing. If it doesn't have to, if, if the card you're using in the 1AC doesn't have multiple uses later in the debate, right? If you can't cross apply it, it's not a 1AC card. Leave that for your blocks, right? 1AC cards should have multiple uses that you could cross apply against other arguments, right? When you're designing your AF, you wanna think about what arguments apply to this AF later on, right? And can the arguments that I'm using uh, and creating in the 1AC be used to answer things that I already know they're gonna say, right? When it comes to traditional apps, right? That's where you have the thumpers, right? Back in the day, folks used to get real hyphy about it and they'd be like, put away your disads. It's already non-unique. They already tried some of the app, but it wasn't enough, right? On the, in the world of the K, right? You get like preamps on framework, right? Is it useful later in the debate? Does it have multiple purposes? That's the distinction between a 1AC card and a 2AC card. So the 1AC should uh, choose a format of comparative advantages and like stock sort of harm scenarios, okay? So comparative advantages are what most policy things do. So um, is the F somehow bigger, right? Is it somehow uh, more likely uh, in, in, in the world of the affirmative? If that you want to have no more than a couple advantages in the F, right? Sometimes you have teams that try to read a lot of advantages in the 1AC just to sort of like throw things against the wall. But that doesn't really help, right? That uh, because it gets spread so thin that you have to waste time articulating it later. So particularly for policy apps, keeping it around two advantages is most helpful because you'll be able to defend that later. And then you want to make sure that you have inherency, impact, solvency, right? And it doesn't have to be structured in that way, but it does have to make that argument, right? Uh, the inherency just, these arguments just need to be established, but that doesn't mean that it needs to be structured to have like contention one, contention two, contention three. But as you're going through the structure of the 1AC and the story of the 1AC, right, does it have all of those elements in it, right? Does it have uh, the stock? Inherency, much like uniqueness evidence, needs to be up to date, right? Especially with this year's topic, things are going to be changing all the time, right? Even with things as simple as the camp AF, uh, the camp novice AF, uh, or the ones that you'll have seen, uh, the police body camps, right? There are policies in certain cities and states that are impacting how the federal level is already addressing some of those issues, right? So this year, in particular, inherency cards and uniqueness cards are going to be super important to um, uh, keep updated. And then second, solvency, and this is the biggest thing that I see a lot of open debaters do. Uh, they kind of like cut and paste different solvency cards because it's like for similar AFs. But then when you read the solvency card, it doesn't really highlight the mechanism of the plan, right? And in this case, uh, what you'll see a lot of that this year on is who's the actor of the plan, right? Which federal agency is it, right? Who is doing the plan? And does your plan uh, match up with that, right? Does your plan say you're going to create some ruling? Um, is it going to be some sort of judicial sort of Supreme Court case? But then what does your solvency talk about? Does your solvency talk about uh, congressional legislation? Does it talk about executive department of justice sort of stuff, right? Does your solvency evidence and the warrants in that match up with the plan? Even in a world where they want to pass similar policies, right? That's the distinction between AF ground and counter plan ground, right? That knowing the distinction in those solvencies uh, will be important to setting up your AF, right? And if you don't have a plan that matches your solvency, um, then that's just game over, right? For as if you end up hitting a negative team that reads your solvency evidence better than you do, right? And your plan doesn't match your solvency, they just get to read back your solvency evidence and say, your authors don't actually agree with your plan. Here's the counter plan, or here's what they actually say is better, right? And then what are you gonna say that you don't believe the, own, the evidence that you read yourself? And so reading your solvency evidence and starting there right, to work backwards to using, uh, to work backwards to sort of frame, write, and design your plan text will be very important, right, especially when it comes to policy questions, because those little nuances uh, are super crucial, right? And then finally, solvency should be realistic. 
uh, and address a practical problem, right? When you're in younger debates and sort of like novice, right, the debates are very general, right? And we're just sort of talking about concepts sometimes when it comes to policy. But as you become more advanced in these policy debates, you should get more specific and practical um, about what that is, right? And then that also helps you be able to better defend yourself in cross X against different types of uh, negative positions, right? Because so much of the time, um, that's where a, a lot of negative strategy comes from, is trying to be able to pick apart those things. So the better you design your 1AC, uh, the better you're able to defend yourself uh, going into the rest of the debate. So as I mentioned earlier, um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this part because y'all are JB and open. Uh, so you've seen some of this before, right? That traditionally, the debate starts with inherency, right? But why do we put that part first, right? It's because it establishes what's going on in the status quo. It sort of creates... Um, and highlights what is the problem going on in the world, right? What is blocking the plan from passing? Is it something that's structural, right? Is there laws in place that prevent things like the act from happening? Is it attitudinal, right? Is it political, right? It, this evidence is going to be very, uh, there's going to be a lot of this kind of evidence this year, right? As different federal policies are proposed, um, that will influence how all of this is going. Hey, I had a question in the chat. Um, if I uh, will send out the link, yes, I will be uploading it to the Discord with your live leaders. Okay, cool. After the inherency, right, once you've sort of set this up, right, personally, I like to think of it as a movie, right, where in the first act, you set up uh, the problem that's going on in the world, but then you create this plan, right, that sort of addresses it and tries to fix it, right? Sometimes teams like to uh, put the advantages first before the plan. That's up to you, right? As long as you have all of those. After the first advantage, you can have a second advantage that follows the same structure, uniqueness, harms, impact, right? Solvency. Um, and at the end, uh, the, the distinction between the harm solvency and the sort of plan solvency, right? Is that each advantage should have a reason why the plan solves that particular advantage. But then you would also need solvency evidence for uh, how this plan in general is advocated for and why we think um, it's an important part of the affirmative. Okay. So once you've got the 1AC down and structured, right, um, it's time for the 2AC, right? And the biggest thing that uh, you all will learn to do on your own, right, because there's only so much time that you're going to be on in person and synchronous with all of us, right, that we'll be doing uh, as a group. Uh, what you after you've got your 1AC, the thing that you spend the most time updating and changing is the 2AC in your blocks, right? Um, and as the app, you should be able to predict a lot of what the negative will be arguing, right? So you need to make sure you know your app well. You need to know that um, there's going to be off-case disadvantages, sort of. And later this week, you'll learn about like what are going to be the most common ones uh, on this topic. Um, and you want to have blocks and answers pre-written for some of those things, right? And even if you miss um, some negative arguments, right? If you do your job correctly to sort of set up uh, your 1AC, you'll be able to um, use your 1AC and lean on that to sort of pull answers across, right? To save time in the 2AC, right? One thing that I think everyone can improve on a little bit uh, in the debate community overall um, is your overviews, right? Their purpose is to highlight and extend offensive arguments and sort of highlight dropped arguments. A lot of the times, this is what I see in debates, is that the overview is just a summary of the case, right? But the overview needs to be unique to the debate that's going on, right? It's not an overview of your case, right? Rather, it's an overview of the debate, right? Where are the pieces on the board right now and where are they going, right? Because by the end of the debate, you want to close those doors, like in the 2ER and the 2NR, right? When it comes to uh, being F, you want to do that as early as the 2AC, right? Because you're all, you want to tell those stories to the judge, right? Because when you already see the 1NC, you could start to predict where the rest of the block is going to go, right? And you could set yourself up to start putting these ideas in the judge's head, right? The AF already outweighs the dishead. The AF already answered these questions, right? That you're sort of planting those seeds, right? The important part of the overview is you want to quote key pieces of evidence, right? You all are amazing and bright individuals, right? But there's a reason that we quote uh, the professionals and use this evidence, right? So don't, you don't have to always reinvent the wheel. Using key sort of short quotes that will stick in the judge's mind and using them in your overview uh, will be super helpful, uh, not just for speaker points, uh, but for the judge. Uh, you'll have judges in your world uh, that, that you judge that uh, 
want the easiest way out, right? That they want a very clear winner, right? And when you have like really clear quotable lines from your evidence uh, that you use in the 2AC, in the 1AR, in the 2AR, right? That makes it very easy for the judge in their RFD just to quote you and use your argument back at you, right? When you sort of make these very clear points and highlight them, um, the judge is like that, right? Personally, when I'm judging debates, whenever there's something that students spend a lot of time on, it makes it very easy for me uh, to sort of point to what they think is most important and how I think the debate should be uh, evaluated and most important, right? A lot of the times, uh, debaters think that the judge is flowing everything and treats all arguments equally, right? But a lot of the time, where the judge looks depends on where you, as the debater, put emphasis. Um, and that's a difficult thing to learn because we usually think the judges are just sort of all-knowing, right? But the truth is, right, that you shape where the debate goes, right? So in that, the judge follows you instead of leading, right? Good judges, at least, right? So where you put emph emphasis uh, will be good for them, right? In terms of timing, generally, you want this to be no longer than 45 seconds to a minute, right? Any longer than that, you're just making arguments at that point, and it's not an overview, right? The overview should be able to create a clear, concise picture, right? But if the overview is this, this long sort of thing, it's no longer uh, easy to stick in the judge's mind, right? That the purpose of the overview is to sort of give uh, a lay of the land, and then you could get into the specifics later. But if your overview is long, um, it sort of defeats the purpose of it. Usually it's in the 2AC, 2NC, 2NRs, but you could do them wherever you need to. Um, as the AF, I would suggest definitely having one in the 2AC um, and definitely later in the debate. Cool. Okay. So when it comes to preparing your 2AC, when it comes to your AF, right, you wanna be smart about where you're spending your time uh, on be better arguments um, rather than um, smaller nitpicky ones, right? Personally, I like really small nitpicky arguments because that's where I have fun and debate. But the truth is you want to get the big arguments out of the way, right? What are the ones that are going to be most common, right? This goes for both policy apps and K apps, right? When it comes to policy apps, what are the most important disads on the topic? What are the most important counterpoints on the topic, right? But also, do these actually apply to my app, right? Did I choose an actor in my 1AC that this applies to or not, right? Um, is it something that's critical um, to these sorts of things, right? And for K apps, right? Do I have my answers to framework, right? Do I have my answers to countering K literature ready to go, right? Sometimes folks have a perception that like K debates are lazy debate because there's, um, I, honestly, I don't even know what the warrant is anymore, right? But those debates go very in depth, right? So do you have different answers to the different links that Ks will be read against, uh, for the different Ks that will be read against you or um, to framework arguments, right? And just sort of, you need to decide where you spend your time because you, although we make the argument that the AF has infinite prep, they just have a lot of prep, right? They don't have infinite prep because time is not infinite, right? You do have limited time. Um, you want to make sure that you hit and cover the ones that are most important and worry about the smaller ones later, right? If two similar arguments are made in a row, you can say just group those arguments, respond to both of them at once, right? So not just before the debates when you're prepping, but in the debate itself, right? You could sort of reduce a lot of these things down to simplify it, right? And before you read new cards, right, consider if you've read a card on the 1AC that answers those arguments, right? Like I was saying earlier, that if you properly design your 1AC, a lot of the times you could take out whole negative strategies with the cards that were already in your 1AC, right? And even in a scenario where, I, where uh, you design an app that could do that, uh, a lot of the times what I see debaters do is even if they have a card in the 1AC, they have a block prepared and instead of like using the card in the 1AC, they just like reread the card in the 2AC from their 2AC block, right? That you want your blocks to be modular and you should recognize when you're reusing a card or when you're referencing a card that was in the 1AC um, just to save time, right? Because the better you design your 1AC, um, the better you could apply it elsewhere. Cool. Okay. So after that, right, you've got the 2AC, you've got your blocks, the block gets up, they defend themselves. They sort of start to narrow down to the debate. You're pressed in the 1AR. The 2NR takes full advantage of that, right? The 2NR goes for the thing that is most, uh, uh, that's most difficult for you to deal with in the 2AR, right? A good 2NR is always gonna take advantage of what the 1AR undercovers, right? So for you, uh, for when you're in the debates and you're closing out the debates, right? 
this means that the two AR can never be prepared ahead of time, right? Sometimes debaters feel safer when they have that like nice little overview and like review of the case that they come in and like reread in the two ER. And that might work in novice debates where the judge like is convinced by uh, the bravado behind it and like how nice you sound, how nice you sound, right? But uh, when you get to these more advanced debates, right? The two ER's only job is answer the two and R, right? That at that point in the debate, everything else falls away. Right? The rest of the debate is only building up to what ends up in the 2NR, right? 2NR choices uh, and what to go for in the 2NR are based off of 1AR coverage, right? But by the time you're in the 2AR, it's just about the 2NR, right? So if you're a 2A, right, the rest of the world goes away at that point. You need to know what was going on in the rest of the debate so you know what tools you have in your arsenal to respond to that 2NR, right? But you only want to spend time are, uh, responding to that and bringing your case back, right? that the focus of your speech needs to respond to specific arguments made in the 2NR, right? That it's not, that the 2AR is not the 2AC, right? You're not making generic arguments, right? The 2AR is closing the debate. So flowing the 2NR is essential, right? If you flow no other debate, uh, no other speech in the debate, you need to flow the 2NR uh, as the 2A. Because you can get away with reading blocks in the 2AC that are questionable uh, in terms of how they apply uh, for the AF, right? That happens all the time. Maybe you run into a disad that you haven't heard before, right? And you sort of just, in your prep, put some stuff together, right? But the 2AR, you need to be very specific, right? So don't be prepping during the 2NR. You need to be flowing, right? And this is why you need to save some prep for the 2AR, right? But having a good flow of the 2NR is essential and extend your impacts, right? Remember, at the end of the debate, you're telling a story, right? What is the problem going on in the world? What are you going to do to change it? what negative implications come from that, but then ultimately, how does the AF address those things? The 2ER should begin by explaining why the judge should vote AF, right? Always at the top, you're telling that story to give the judge an overview, and in 30 seconds, why vote AF, right? The AF solves this problem that outweighs the disad, right? And now let me show you exactly the specifics, okay? And honestly, 2ERs have a reputation for lying, so uh, embrace it. Uh, when it comes to the 2AR, right, you're spinning a lot of these arguments, right, that sometimes it's it's a little questionable, it's a little iffy, um, but if you're not cheating, you're not trying, right. Uh, even if you, there are arguments that you think you didn't really build earlier in the debate, don't be afraid to build them in the 2AR, right, um, to just sort of extrapolate on the things you have there. Don't just go out of your way to, like, uh, create new arguments that clearly weren't there. Right, but I, what I mean is to put spin on your arguments, right? Because the judge will sometimes like can usually just sort of like buy your spin in the 2ER. And at that point, what's the 2ER gonna say? They're done, they got nothing else to say, they got no time. They'll argue with the judge after they get, after they sign the ballot for you, right? Um, so 2ER is often about spin, right? And how you apply those arguments and outweigh it, right? It's a very beneficial place to be at the end of the debate, okay? So you give an overview, you hype it up a lot, right? You hype it up in ways that you hadn't hyped up in the debate before, right? You hype it up and make it seem like it's the greatest thing in the world, right? Then you extend your plan and the specific way uh, with its advantages, uh, why you solve best, right? Um, you extend the plan within the context of the permutation, um, right? Of other things or why you solve best. I think you wanna sort of deal with um, the world that you're entering in the 2ER, right? That there's going to be some change with how you talk about the F from the 1AC to the 2ER, right? In the 1AC, the plan is sort of in a vacuum. But by the 2ER, you're comparing it to the disads, you're comparing it to the counter plans, you're comparing it to the K. Um, so you want to take that into account when you're articulating it, right? And why comparatively uh, it's better, right? Then you want to explain why the opposition cannot solve or access your advantages, right? Show how they make the world worse, right? A lot of the times when people sort of think about advantages, right, they just think about it as benefits to the plan, but you also want to think about it inversely, right? That advantages are simply disadds to the status quo, right? When they say that, uh, when, KA, uh, when policy teams say like, weigh the AF against the K, right? This is what they're talking about, right? That there's a trade-off, that by not voting AF, you do not get those advantages, right? That there is a disadvantage to voting negative. Right, that you put the weight on them, right? That the negative makes the world worse. That it's not just an advantage to vote F, but there is a disadvantage to voting negative, 
right? Because then that puts, it, it changes the framing for the judge, right? That there is a, there's an issue there um, to deal with that, right? That the negative isn't, it, it puts the negative in a position where they don't just have to negate, right? They have to defend their world, right? It frames the debate um, as the AF versus the score or the AF versus the counterpoint or the AF versus the K instead of uh, is the AF good or bad, right? It's how is the AF comparatively? Then you want to move on from focusing on specific argument. Uh, you want to move on to focusing on specific arguments or offense that the two and R went for in their speech, right? The two and R narrows down the debate to specific places where the judge is going to vote, right? So you want to spend specific time isolating those things, right? What was their strategy in the two and R, right? What do they think is going to win them the debate, and why do you still address that, right? Is it the alternative solves the case, or is it that the K turns the case? Um, is it that they have some sort of important case turn, right? A lot of the times by the two and R, arguments are getting cross applied. Um, and on this year's topic, what you're gonna see a lot of is case turn debates when it comes to the K, right? When it comes to disads, right? Um, all of these are gonna have very big uh, turns. Um, so you always wanna address those offenses, right? And two and R's will narrow it down to one or two big ones. Um, the advantage for negatives on that front is that uh, it makes it easy for the judge and you have more time to articulate it. But for the AF, um, again, you don't want to spend time answering arguments that aren't in the 2 R, right? If you have a judge that you think might have been a little iffy and might do work, like using arguments that were er earlier in the debate, you could remind them, like, hey, earlier in the debate, like during the block, they went for this turn and they spent a lot of time on it in the 1 and R, but it wasn't in the 2 and R. Ignore it and then answer the ones that they actually made. Okay. That you're focusing on those specific arguments.